Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, episode 152, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. Let's get cracking. As usual, the first section of the week is getting started, and we got six articles here today, starting with creating custom RxJS operators, which is pretty self explanatory, in my opinion. Next one is improving Node.js application performance with clustering, a pretty nice tutorial for clustering in Node.js. Following is an introduction to finite state machines simplifying React state management with state machines. Uh, this is sort of a mix of, you know, introduction to state management using state machines when you build your own state machine. And then it expands to this tutorial for X state, which is uh, pretty awesome. So if you wanted to learn that, do check this one out. Next one is lazy load routes in view with Webpack dynamic comments. Again, uh, pretty self-explanatory. Following one is HTML form validation in Cypress, a pretty good deep dive into the handling form validation in Cypress and making sure that form is actually valid before triggering the submission. Next one is dynamic static, uh, blah, let me try that again, dynamic static typing in TypeScript, which is basically deep dive into more advanced typing techniques in TypeScript, such as the union types, uh, generics, and so on and so forth. So if you're working with TypeScript, do check this one out. Right, now we're coming to the articles and news. We got two here today, starting with experimenting with remote debugging Node.js runtime code injection. This one talks about the techniques for, well, remote code injection and remote debugging and triggering the debugging in already running Node.js processes, which honestly I didn't know was a thing. So apparently if you send the SIG USR1 signal to the Node app, it will actually enable debugging on the WebSocket, which you can connect to and basically interact with the process, even if it is already running, which is uh, pretty cool. There's a bit more information here. So if you're interested, do check it out. It's a pretty interesting read. Next one we got here is introducing private click measurements PCM from the WebKit uh, dev team. This one is quite interesting. So uh, you know that advertisement is sort of this industry that is now everyone basically hates, n not because it's, you know, the ads are everywhere or whatever, but because of purely how intrusive and how anti-privacy it is, right? And one of the things that I really like that the WebKit people do is actually trying to bring more privacy into the web features. This is one of those initiatives and the idea is that basically to bring more privacy to the users while also providing the feedback to the online advertisers without like destroying their business completely, right? So because ads are still a valid thing, you still wanna see them occasionally, you just don't want them to scrape all your data while they're doing that, right? So the idea here is to introduce this new private click measurement API that allow you to, or rather allow online advertising companies to actually track the clicks, but without, well, ability to track users. There's quite a few things going under the hoods, uh, including stuff like delaying actually the reports on clicks between 24 to 48 hours to actually dissociate the events in time, which is pretty fascinating. There's also a ton of other like uh, privacy related concerns here. So if you're interested in how exactly that works, I would absolutely encourage you to read this because there is some very interesting stuff in here. Right. That's it for the articles in use. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. We do have quite a few things here today, starting with what WebRDC means for you. A really good write-up on what WebRDC is, what does it mean, what does the standardization of it mean, as we talked the last time, and uh, you know how exactly does it works with uh, either developers or um, your typical users of it, basically. So if you're working with WebRDC or planning to do that, do check this one out. It's a pretty good write-up. Next one we got here is a Visual Studio Code, how Microsoft's any OS, any programming language, any software plan is paying off. A pretty cool write-up on sort of the history and the direction of uh, VS Code. A uh, fascinating number for me personally was that there's already 14 million users of VS Code and a lot of them are actually non-programmers. There's like a lot of writers apparently are using VS Code, for example which is absolutely fascinating. There's a bit more information here. So, you know, if you're curious, do check it out. Again, VS Code is my favorite editor. So that's, you know, uh, probably not, not surprising to anyone that I am um, pretty excited to see the future of this thing. All right, continue. We got new proposal, a new ECMAScript proposal uh, called Wavy Dot. So the gist is that you basically allows you to do the tilde dot and then property function, whatever 
and execute. Uh, essentially, it will await for the promise to resolve and then do the thing after the dot, right? So if you say fetch something and then before that you had to do like then our JSON or whatever, now you can just do fetch and then wavy dot JSON and this will be equivalent to chaining the then basically, right? Uh, which is pretty great, honestly. I'm not sure I really dig the tilde dots notation, which feels just a bit clunky, but I, I guess there's, you know, there's not that much choice here because, yeah, it's like you, it gotta be pretty condensed, right? And there's already like proposals they are thinking about doing, combining this with optional chaining, which would be quite awesome actually. And would allow you to skip quite or I guess simplify quite quite a lot of things syntactically. But yeah, it's um, it's an interesting one for sure. I do like this initiative because even using fetch, it's always annoying to do this. You know, then a result result dot JSON whatever, and then you do another then and return from that JSON to something them properties and pick them and just using wavy dot would be a lot easier. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a straw man, so it was just suggested, not even stage zero for now, I think. Or is it, wait, wait straw man is stage zero, right? If I remember correctly. Um, wait a second, let me just uh, quickly, quickly check. Um, anyway, uh, so it's straw man proposal for now. We're going to see how that develops. No, wait a second. It's not straw man anymore. I am confusing it with the concurrency. So it's actually stage one already. Um, that was quick. Um, anyway... <laughs> It's a stage one proposal and uh, I do like the idea behind it. Again, as I said, I'm not entirely sure if this tilde dots thing is the best way, but apparently there is no other way to go because because we have legacy software that we have to be compatible with and it's a bit of a pain in the ass, but uh, there you go. So let's see how fast this one will get to stage three and all the engines will implement it, but I do really like the idea behind it. Continue, we got npm diff. It's a really nice write-up that introduces you to a new npm diff command and how it works and how exactly you can use it. So if you wanted to uh, figure that out, this is a really good starting point. Uh, next one is announcement from npm blog. npm 7 is now generally available, which means that next time you install Node.js, the latest version is going to come with npm 7. And when you do npm install minus gnpm, you will get actually the latest version 7. Uh, there's a bunch of things to keep in mind. First of all, there are some changes to log files. There's a new log file format, so you might want to regenerate your log files. Uh, it also now supports the yarn log file and will use it if it is present in the repository. And the peer dependencies are now installed by default. And this might break a lot of things for you. Keep that in mind. Um, it's actually like there is... I will talk about it in a second, but there's a pretty good reason why they decided to do this. Because even now while not installing peer dependencies, it also breaks things quite a bit more than when installing them essentially. So this is apparently a very good thing for uh, depths. Although, you know, even I personally, I didn't really have any problems like that before, but yeah, apparently that's a pretty big issue. And uh, this essentially solves it on a fundamental NPM level, basically, which is great. So there you go, npm7 is now GA. So next thing here is this uh, pretty big thread that talks specifically about why npm7 automatically install peer dependencies, what does it solve and why it is important. There is a pretty big thread here from uh, Isaacs, who is one, I think he's a CTO at uh, npm, if I remember correctly. But anyway, um, a really good write-up, very detailed explanation of why that happens and what are the problems related to that. So if you're interested in, in reasoning, do absolutely read through this. There's some really good stuff here. Continuing, we got um, Today I Learned, I guess, from uh, Chris Heilman uh, on... Uh, apparently, there is... Like, if you, if you ever use the Chrome or Edge or, you know, any Chromium derivative, essentially, uh, there is a very nice color picker for colors and CSS when you inspect it, Right. What I did not know is that there is actually a way to select color palettes and use them when picking colors, which is pretty awesome. And there's like a bunch of them, including stuff like material, picking the page colors, CSS variables, and so on and so forth, which is super handy. So if you're working a lot with CSS and colors and did know that, maybe this will save you some time. All right, continuing, we got Node.js 14 runtime is now available in Amazon Web Services Lambda, finally. 
So if you're using Amazon Web Services Lambda and you wanted to use the latest Node LTS, now you finally can. So there you go. Uh, do check it out. Again, upgrades. Um, you know, even if you don't need any specific Node 14 features, I would recommend upgrading anyway because there is quite a ton of improvements in V8 on its own, even without the new features, basically. So it's definitely worth time um, upgrading. And the last thing we got here is announcement from Dr. Uh, blah, let me try that again. From Dr. Axel Rauschmeier on his uh, book JavaScript for Impatient Programmers. There is now an ES 2021 edition with all the basically new JavaScript features added. So if you want it, first of all, you can read it online for free if you want to. And yeah, if you like it, just buy it and support it. It's pretty great. Uh, again, his content is generally very awesome. So do check it out. All right, that's it for the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we got releases here. We got six of them, starting with Vuex version four, which is uh, mostly a compatibility release and basically adds compatibility of Vuex for Vue 3. It has the same API, just compatible with the next version of Vue. So if you were waiting for, you know, upgrading your project, holding out until the Vuex is updated, now is the time. Uh, doesn't seem like anything else is um you know there's much other changes there are some breaking changes but they seem to be relatively minor so it seems like it's a pretty straightforward upgrade path next release we got here is ck editor 5 version 25 that adds a bunch of pretty cool features so you know if you're working with uh reach editors and you wanted i don't know fancy editor for yourself or maybe you already use ck editor which is, by the way is pretty good pretty good library um this seems like a pretty solid update, so do check this one out. Continuing, we got Chrome 89 beta. I don't generally highlight beta releases, but this one includes so many cool features that I just wanted to do that. So basically, number one, we got Web HID API. Number two, we got Web NFC. Number three, we got Web Serial API. And number four, we got Web Sharing on desktop, which is uh, pretty bonkers, to be honest. And all of that is shipped in, in the beta version and seems like all of that will make it to the release version, which is uh, kind of cool. So yeah, now you can use HID, NFC and serial devices right in your browser without any additional setup. And uh, it's honestly a very exciting time to be a web developer. So there you go. If you're curious, do check out the beta version uh, probably coming. Uh, I think they're usually release the stable version in like a month or two. So yeah, we're gonna get it as a live version in uh, relatively short time span so even if you don't want to install the beta it's uh, coming out quite soon so just hold out a bit and you can try and play out with your hid devices or scan some nfc tags or maybe use a printer directly from javascript which is again uh, on one hand super terrifying on another hand quite damn awesome so there you go okay continuing we got node.js version 15.8 which um well, it mostly brings minor things such as, you know, adding a board signal to an abort controller support to more methods. Uh, the exciting thing for me is the experimental Edwards curve cryptography support here, which is the EDX25519 uh, and EDX448, uh, which is something that I think majority of people are now using to generate their private and public keys for, you know, SSH, whatever. And it was one of the primary pain points in the, um, what do you call it, the exaframe, where I only basically supported the old SSH keys that were not as secure, basically, as this, right? So SHA, whatever it was, I don't remember. But yeah, it's kind of cool to see this, again, experimental for now. Uh, hopefully we'll get finalized pretty soon. Uh, but it's really awesome that we're getting more cryptography features and uh, pretty fancy ones. Okay, continuing, we got V8 version 8.9 that adds top level weight in Blink, a rendering engine. Uh, again, the same uh, version 89 means the Chrome 89, Chromium 89, Edge 89, and so on and so forth. So uh, again, it's been uh, available a while in Node.js if you use the uh, ES modules, right? But uh, now we can finally use it in browsers, which is pretty cool. So obviously some performance improvements as usual. So if you're curious about the whole release, do check this one out. Okay, last release we got here today is VS Code version 1.53, bringing us 
Wrap tabs, I know that this is something that a lot of people wanted. So instead of uh, having the scroll bar on top with the tabs, you actually get them wrapped into multiple rows, which uh, again, you know, I'm not the person who usually has more than a couple of tabs open because my head just doesn't work this way and I cannot really keep a lot of things in, in, in my head. So I tend to focus on a few tabs rather than opening like 20 of them. But I know that some people are work in exactly the opposite way when they open a ton of tabs and just go through them. Might be helpful if you do that. Um, there's a bunch of other improvements basically. So do check it out if you're using any of those things. And there's now a remote development video series that actually introduces you to using the VS Code remotely within containers, servers, and so on and so forth. Which by the way is a freaking amazing feature. Not even talking about containers, but the fact that I can just set up the remote VS Code server on my server and then just SSH into it via VS Code and edit stuff live in there through my VS Code as if it was my local machine is freaking incredible. Like, let me, I use it constantly and it is awesome. Not even because I'm using VSL, which basically works the same way, right? But man, this feature is a lifesaver. So if you never heard about it, if you never used it, absolutely do check this one out. Right, that's it for the releases. Now we got Libs and Demos. We, for whatever reason, only got four of them here today, starting with Cheval or Ch Ch Cheval. I'm not sure how to read that. I guess Cheval. This is the copy to clipboard using JavaScript without actually writing JavaScript. Essentially allows you to uh, easily set up copy to clipboard button for any and all text you want on the page by just assigning some classes and uh, just writing one tiny JavaScript line basically, which, you know, is kind of nice, I guess, when you don't want to deal a lot with copy pasting. Then again, with modern JavaScript API, copy pasting is super straightforward. But, uh, you know, if you are looking for something like this, do check this one out. Next one we got is desk screen. This one is super awesome. It basically turns any device with a web browser into a secondary screen for your computer. And it's completely open source, which is amazing. Like this is again, highlight of, of the week probably for me. And uh, there is a ton of details here on how it works. It's pretty cool project. If you wanted to turn any device with a browser into a second screen for your computer, do check this one out. Absolutely really cool uh, stuff. And yeah, again, permissive licenses and everything. Uh, very cool things here, demonstrations, whatever, pre-built binaries, basically anything you can imagine. Everything is here, so do check this one out. Okay, next thing we got here is Release Please from Google API. This is a pretty convenient tool for generating release pull requests based on the conventional commit spec. Uh, I'm not personally using conventional commit spec, but you know, if you are and you wanted the auto release generation, this seems like a pretty solid tool. Uh, if you're not familiar with the conventional commit spec, is this thing where you know you put the prefix and then feature, I believe, and then description of what you actually did. So it's, for example, feet colon, blah, 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 or fix, blah, 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 or feet rust, blah, blah, blah. And it will basically the, uh, so there's the actually convention around that, right? And this release generator will actually go through that and figure out if it's a major release, minor release, or just the patch basically based on those prefixes, which, you know, if you are using semantic versioning, it's actually very easy to do and uh, it's uh, maybe I should adopt this this convention because it does sound very handy. <laughs> but anyway, if you are looking for a release tool like this, do check this one out. It's now version 10 and uh, seems to be pretty damn great. Okay, last thing we got here for today is ESLint config auto. Automatically configure ESLint based on project dependencies. Uh, honestly, don't know what exactly does that mean and how exactly it works, but it uh, seems like it will configure the Airbnb ESLint rules and range of other plugins based on the contents of project package JSON for some reason. Like I'm not, I guess it like automatically includes React and stuff probably because this is my guess, right? I'm not, not entirely sure uh, like why or what or how, but if you ever wanted to, for some reason, having an auto generated config for ESLint, do check it out. Maybe this is what you wanted. Right, that's it for Leaves and Demos. The last thing we got here for today is this uh, silly thing from Twitter um, about getting iOS to not scroll to focused inputs is tricky, but it's possible for determined. And um, yeah, there's <laughs> essentially for whatever reason, the uh, WebKit or I guess, yeah, WebKit on iOS 
has a bunch of exceptions uh, where it actually avoids scrolling when focused. Uh, and it's just, there's what, 71 domain that, that are basically exceptions for some reason. And it's just weird. Like the, the whole thing is just weird. Sometimes Apple does some very strange things with it. And uh, yeah, the, the whole thread is a bit hilarious. So if you're curious, do check it out. There's links to the source code and everything, which is uh, pretty amusing. Right, uh, that's actually it from my side. So this was BXJS Weekly episode 152. As usual, you can find all the links on GitHub or on bxjs.dev. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Uh, if you want to discuss any of that, drop a comment below or join our Discord server. You can also follow the Twitter bots uh, at some point. For now, it's just me. Uh, and you can also follow the Telegram channel if you want unfiltered links. That's basically it from my side. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.